welcome back to Podcastle in the Sky. And we promised in our last podcast that we'd be discussing Rose of Versailles and Marie Antoinette. And the thing is, we actually did, but we lost the recording. We will return to that subject at a later point, but for now, we'll be looking at something different. We will be discussing Fist of the North Star, the 1986 movie, to be specific, and Mad Max, specifically the second film, The Road Warrior. Two classic examples of extravagantly melodramatic 1980s punk post-apocalyptic violence with more action scenes than dialogue, more or less, and a lot of deserts and wandering and stoic masculinity and all these other things which we will be rambling about at some length. <laughs> I'm William. I'm Amber. I'm Dylan. I'm Jesse. And I'm Tom. All right. I would like to start this conversation out with the uh, amount of entrails I have witnessed now pretty much <laughs> fills my quota for the year. So thank you, whoever suggested Fist of the North Star. You can all blame that on me. Thank you. Uh, but we, we, still, we, still have, we still have a third of the year left. Do you know how much more entrails we can fit in four months? Oh God, I, I, I don't know. I I can think of a handful, but as far as as far as entrail explosions go, this is really the top of the game, top of the line. I mean, there was a part where like I was starting to get just numb from from the amount. It was just like, yep, that guy is exploding from the inside out. Yeah. So yeah. for the for the uninitiated, and this is never actually explained in the movie at all. No one ever no one ever mentions why this is happening. You just have to know, I guess. The martial art that our, our hero, Ken Kinshiro, has mastered after being passed down from the wise old sage man in his mountain temple is basically that you, you punch someone in, in such a perfect place that it makes that part of their body expand and then explode. <laughs> in, it's, it's just it's a, sort of a sort of a half scanners, half kill bill two thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, scanners yeah, is actually a good comparison. Definitely. Except <laughs> except even the scanners, because yeah. whenever anybody gets punched in this, it's not just that their heads explode or their bodies everything's exploding. But it's first it like grotesquely expands. Like it reminds me of an anime when a when when a capital ship in space is about to explode and it like you know, all, all the metal starts expanding outward. In this case it's it's people's heads. And then they explode. Um yeah, it's pretty exceptional. Even for me, sometimes I was like, "It's a little, it's a little much." <laughs> okay, um, you know what? I had the opposite reaction because uh, not when, enough entrails. No, no, it when is I, funny. When I thought, yes, it was hilarious. I was like, <laughs> like the question popped up into my mind: "Is like, is North Star supposed to be badass? Because it's so excessive. It's it becomes its own parody." It know? does. <laughs> well, what's great is, I mean, we're talking about you know exploding humans, but what struck me watching this movie is that you can't not have exploding humans because everything in this world explodes. <laughs> everything. There's this scene. There is an amazing scene. Where, um, Ken is asleep. He's recently been resurrected after being thrown down a what, wait, chasm. But was so, he anyway, resurrected? Was that what it was? Was he resurrected by Lynn or whatever? Or, or did oh, he just I, I think, Yeah, I, I thought, thought it was... summoned him because of some psychic Yeah. Oh. No, I thought it was like one of those things where he, sh he the guy should have killed him but instead he threw him away and left him for dead. You know, the classic revenge or mistake. Oh, no, right. I mean, how many stories about revenge have involved true. someone being completely betrayed by people and then left for dead? It's like, oh, this guy's never going to get out of that situation. He's certainly not going to spend the rest of the movie hunting us down. We're in the clear. No one's good enough at thoroughly killing someone in movies. Just Okay, look, it was a reasonable thing to assume he was dead because he dropped him down the cliff and then he dropped the cliff on him. So Yeah, that is, this is true. Oh. Yeah, I mean well, it's anime. Come on, people I mean, have survived the thing is, worse. It's funny, but because um, I'm I'm guessing this must be like a bunch of the manga just crushed into a movie. Because oh yeah, the, he gets and thrown down, down, that, down that chasm, and next time we see him, he's just like so much better at everything. But <laughs> yeah. there's not like a there's not like a training montage where he like gets better in the chasm. Like he just is. Like well, you know, it's explained at all. Yeah, but anyway, you know. explain like how much time has passed. Yeah, like you know he's say. thrown down a thing, and then the one brother destroys the temple, and the next thing we know, there's pink-haired children and murder on a like desert plain, 
and he comes out with a beard. So I guess some time has passed. But beard doesn't time. kill you. But then remember, oh, yeah. also his brother has become a, like a Conan bad guy. Yeah, out of this nowhere. Is true. He has yeah. like a huge yes. army yes. of people. He's like yeah. with the helmets and everything. For a while, I had no idea who he was. I was like, hang on. Why is there this other bad guy? What's his relationship? I, I was lost for a bit, to be honest. But remember, I that, realized a lot of people. The thing that makes me think he died is that when he gets summoned by the little girl, like he doesn't appear as a human, he appears as like a fucking golem. Oh, Remember, yeah, he's that's right. He like stone. I forgot about that. Yeah, <laughs> and then it breaks up. So I thought like he died and, and she summoned him back as like some for, the superior being. I don't know enough about the the lore I, of this I, world, but that's why I assume interpretation way better. <laughs> but um, but going it back does to work a little better. Yeah, yeah. Going, going back to what started this this tangent. But during the scene where he comes back as a golem, you know, all these buildings collapse around him. But then he keeps walking forward, and there's this one building to the side, and for no reason, for no reason, he side punches it, and the entire thing collapses. He was really... And then this building building that he punched falls on him, and he walks through it. And then the scene after that, where he's asleep, the, the town guard starts getting attacked by these same bandits that were attacking the kids, and so he's awakened by the need of the little girl to protect her, and when he sits up, like again, he's he's asleep on this table, prone. And when he wakes up, and when he sits up, the table explodes under him. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that that. is when I just embrace the fact that everything exploded in this movie, people included, because was uh, it's just the laws of this universe. Whatever bombs they create in the the next war, <laughs> irradiated everything to just explode on command. So, <laughs> You know, it's almost like a hallucinatory id action movies. You know, the explosions and the muscular guys and the improbable action. It's like all of that filtered through a complete disconnect to anything but the most threadbare idea of a plot. Like, why does he punch a building? Because wouldn't it be cool for him to punch a building and it collapse in him and he'd survive? That would make an individual. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, like, there's a perfunctory plot, there's an attempt at it, and there's an attempt at characters, but it all feels extremely half-hearted, especially, like, the wayfish girl who's there to protect. She's kind of innocence and a reminder that not everything in the world is a bunch of incredibly muscular guys punching each other to death or something. Well, it's, it's like, we kind of need to have this in the movie, but it's like I think. There's, like, you know? stuff in the, that, that is somewhat implied because, like, at the very end, uh, when the brother wanders off into the freaking distance after his, I don't know how he supplied his people in this wasteland with, his, you know, their awesome armor and stuff. But anyway, like, he, like, he, like, puts his shoulder, or hands on her shoulders and is like, Lynn, you gotta grow up. And soon, you know why, don't you? Huh? Yeah? And then he walks away. <laughs> like, we don't know why. <laughs> yeah, the, the last <laughs> scene, so the last scene in this movie for the people who haven't watched it is truly confounding and is what confirmed to me that this must be like a bunch of arcs from the manga just just crunched into a two hour time frame because what happens oh, yeah. is that Rua, who is another disciple of the same old Gerard, he's he's angry that he's not the fist of the North Star. So this was actually one of my favorite parts of the movie. But like William said, he becomes basically Conan the Barbarian. In, in a post-apocalyptic world, and he has this, like, awesome, like, Roman-slash-barbarian helmet mixed into one. It's incredible. I would watch a show all about it. But so, he and Ken just, they, they go in for their final battle, and it's like this apocalypse, like, uh, Man of Steel would feel bashful at the amount of physical <laughs> destruction that happens in this battle. The entire city <laughs> is just torn asunder by this fight between these two men. And, and the best thing is, like, everybody's, like, running and screaming in horror. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, cool. And, um, but so, my favorite part of the fight is actually that for the entire first half, Rua, Rua the Conqueror doesn't get off his horse. <laughs> like, he's he's levitating, and they're fighting in the sky and still on his horse. It's fantastic. No, it's that's not the best part. The best part is, like, when they touch ground again, he goes... Well, I guess I'll demean myself by getting off my horse. Yeah. <laughs> and, Actually, you know but what? so anyway, they destroy the entire city. And then Ken 
easily, you know, he's defeated, basically. He, like, you could kill him. But then the little girl walks over, and she's like, you shouldn't do this. <laughs> and, and then the villain of the entire movie, who has been slaughtering people just indiscriminately, is like, yeah, okay, you're right. <laughs> and then he walks away into this, and there's, a, there's this amazing shot of, of the entire city, which is now a giant crater, and, and there's this, like, beautiful <laughs> sunset. There's this beautiful sunset as as the villain just walks away. And what's even better is that right before the fight happens, Ray, who's who's like Ken's bro throughout the movie, is like, Don't don't fight. Everything will be lost. And, and so that but they have to fight because it's fucking Chris of the North Star. <laughs> and then he di- he dies. Sure. They fight and they destroy the entire city and then they're like, uh, yeah, I guess this is a bad idea. <laughs> Like, it, this is a change of heart in the villain. It's so sudden. But the best part with the Ray speech, too, is it's like a good two-minute speech about how they shouldn't fight, and it'll destroy things, and he'll destroy his own soul, and yada, 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 and then he goes, Bleh. and then Ken, like, goes, Ray. And then yeah. just immediately <laughs> goes, boom, power fight, let's go. It's fantastic. <laughs> well, actually, you know what? I have... Two favorite things from that climax. One of them is, well, when the head bad guy, he sees a flower, he becomes so angry, he crucifies a woman. It's like, <laughs> it's like you, how could you have this flower? This flower does not belong in our world. And he crucifies her. I was like, that's kind of an overreaction. But, <laughs> but it actually made me realize, well, it was one of the things that made me realize that this, this movie or this whole property was basically this 12-year-old boy's, like, notebook doodles. <laughs> it's like from this, like, uh, girls are icky idea of masculinity. Like, it's the post-apocalyptic future. It's just like this giant sausage party. Just like, all these two women okay. in the entire world. Let's let's talk girls for just a second with this movie. Uh, beyond Lynn, who I think was the only one who yeah. got any kind of character, quote-unquote, about her. And all she did was she was cute. And talk about flowers. And but so anybody else have a problem with like the gross implied rapiness that was going on? One mm. thing about it is um one of the characters says, Hey, this is kind of like that Greek book that I never finished reading. That, that I thought was the most <laughs> single most self aware line in the entire oh, movie. Yeah. And I have to wonder if that was added by the frustrated dubbers. Because I know obviously <laughs> Notoriously, the dubbers of uh, Fist of the North Star in France hated it, so they just turned the entire thing into a ridiculous parody. Oh, there are a couple so of nice little jokes like that. See, I, didn't I just watch love the dub. that because it's such a the dub. sub. I should have watched the dub. So, so there's no, was there no uh, Greek novel oh, joke in the sub? Oh, no, that was an important no, question. Wasn't. No, oh, really interesting. It was it was a great line because it was like, "Hey, this is like that Greek book I never finished reading." <laughs> the one concession to culture. <laughs> That they briefly have, they then immediately undermine. Yeah. But yeah, to, to pivot back to the original point, um, I believe the word we we're all looking for is problematic. Probably. And yes, it is. Yeah, yeah, that well, that. Like, I mean, it's, it's, it's the same thing as Golgo, but less gross. But yeah, it's the same yeah. Thing. yeah. I mean, there wasn't like we didn't watch a creepy guy lick a girl's shoulder. It's less you know. And she does. The difference all... between this also, and Golgo is Golgo has women in its world. This mm-hmm. is mostly excise them. Like Galgo yeah. keeping the Bond format, it has a lot of different women in it with different relationships and different roles and different types. And here it's like there's the woman and there's the girl. But it's mostly about all these relationships with these guys. Yeah. It creates one of those situations where just just by the fact that we're we're less indulging in the just relentless torment and exploitation of women, just by omitting them almost entirely, it's somewhat less terrible than Galgo is on that front. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I was just going to say, the way a lot of these schlocky 80s properties show that the bad guys are bad and that they're degenerates is right. Like, it's mm-hmm. it's all over. And I'm not saying that's a good thing, but um, it's, like, just one of these staples of these movies. And it's from a, from a modern perspective, it's, like, it's not, not great because it is. It's, like, this lazy. It's, like, how do we make this guy bad? Oh, I know. We'll have him. Well, somebody. Dude, like it's the... usually more explicit as well. I mean, this was relatively tame. Yeah, this is true. This was for for a movie that was filled with entrails. Like the one uh, Ray's sister, who was clearly in some sort of rapey situation with uh, what's his face, the younger brother. 
or older brother, older brother, you know, gross face, gross face, the older brother. Yes. Um, <laughs> aren't they all, aren't they all gross face? Well, this yeah. one was, he was the one who had all the tubies in his he, head. He had a face that was, was like, so clearly just, something. Just, like, well, he looked pretty dark good dark. until he got like the tubal stuff on his face. Right, right, Like right. early in the movie, he was like the blonde guy. So he looked pretty all right. Yeah, he looked pretty all right. And then he got all like misshapen and, and yeah. like lined the girl because she found him grotesque. And clearly something rapey was going on there. But, but it was more of kind of like, oh, look at, he, she's been debased so much that all she can say that is that she loves her master. You know what I mean? Yeah. At Which, least they let her get out of it. Yeah, like, like, without she, dying. She's able to redeem her yeah. humanity. And, like, it's not like, oh, she's so far gone, I have to kill her or something. Like, she's or at least... she's going to become well, some what, what prostitute. Extremely yeah. low bars were set <laughs> yes, in here. Oh, yeah, I know. Uh, it's yeah. the lowest bars, but... That she was raped horrifically, but she got to live, guys. You know, <laughs> we were subjected to a long yeah. scene. I mean, yeah. That's a plus. That is. True. I, I, I've been yeah. extremely desensitized to this say. stuff over the years to the point that it should disturb me. Yeah, it, it, it's it's kind of like a little disturbing that like the fact that you know Lynn showed her a flower and so she could live on is like oh good oh this is a good thing. <laughs> this, could, yeah, this could be so much worse. <laughs> this could be- it's kind of funny, like uh, when North Star. I mean, it takes itself entirely too seriously and. There was this one specific point where it got hilarious for me. Was um when what's his name um Ken's bro uh, what not his real bros his uh, um, um, uh, uh starts with an Ray, S. Ray. Uh, Ray. Okay, yeah, yeah, that oh, guy. Is it, is it the bestie? The bestie? He yeah, makes? yeah, the best friend. Silver hair. Uh, yeah, when the best friend dies, and when Ray is holding his body in his arms. His lifeless pose was directly taken from Michelangelo's sculpture, Pieta, which is of Jesus Christ being held in in Mary's arms. It's like this iconic image of... So so very many things love borrowing Pieta imagery. This is one where it really stands out. It's like, really? It's treating it like some kind of universal tragedy. I know. You know, it's like just like... (laughs) Two seconds before, he was fighting with like electric guitars in the background. Oh my god, so out, that was it's so the out of best place, totally and stylistically. The idea of doing that, but you're right, Amber was well, that was Shin's an important, I, I important guy in the movie because he he doesn't explode people, he slices people. So it adds nice. it adds an important. Actually, there's a really great shot where it's like. Uh, oh yeah, the the one where the guy seems to like move aside from the screen, be realized yes, because yes, all the different the parts one. of him. Yes. Yeah, it's like this little like uh like Tetris moment with like the guy that. with the guy's <laughs> body. It was fantastic. By yeah. the time I saw that, you know, I had seen so many explosions. I was just nice. It was just nice to see something a little different. Like, oh, yeah. he was spread like a like a little platter of sushi. There, it was very nice. It was, it was great. <laughs> a moment of creativity. How refreshing! I, I think you could say that's the issue with North Star in general. It's not that it has so much violence. It's that a lot of the violence is pretty samey. Yeah, it's nice to have that kind of variation. Another moment that I did appreciate for its grotesquerie was when Mister Giant Steel skin guy had a dude like crash into him and he smacked him like a mosquito and just the guy like goes sploosh like all over. Yeah, those poor, oh. those poor soldiers. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, there's this one giant thing hanging over Fist of the North Star and that is how much it has taken from Mad Max. Oh, War. yeah. Because like so much of mm-hmm. it was, I was trying not to keep a list but <laughs> I kept noticing it. Like the dune buggies, that thing where a uh, the guy looks like Lord Humongous. Oh, yeah. oh yes, yeah. Mm-hmm. In general, the idea of all the punk subculture, you know, the the haircuts and everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, yeah, it's exactly. interesting you brought up Humongous because the original idea for Humongous is actually closer to a Fist of the North Star antagonist because he was originally mm-hmm. going to be Goose. Goose was in the first Mad Max movie. One of Max's companions is a cop in the world as it's falling apart, and he gets horrifically mutilated. He's not killed. He's just mutilated. He's left there. And then in another movie, he has to face this crazy warlord who, you know, wears a mask. And originally, that was going to be Goose, but they dropped the idea. But similar to how, you know, Ken meets his old friends, they're now his enemies, and they've morphed into, like, really weird-looking monster men. I don't know if that's intentional, but it's interesting. Fist is so... I mean, what? what there's a lot of things that distinguish them, even though they, you know, North Star... Borrows, so <laughs> generous uh, term, but borrow so extensively. But as far as the way the world and the 
characters work. It's it, it's kind of funny that even though Ken is this guy who, as we've mentioned many times uh, already, makes people literally explode, he's way more of a traditional hero figure in some way or another than Max is. Like, they're the, the, the man who makes people explode is at least ostensibly, you know, sticking up for the weak uh, and for the, the, righteous, the righteous causes. But it's weird because... Road Warrior also engages much more with its world. Fist of the North Star, even though Ken is talking about, you know, rebuilding the world and everything, it's it really barely exists outside of the conflicts of these individual muscle men. Whereas yeah. there's there's a there's yeah. absolutely a world that exists in the Road Warrior. Yeah. Which is what makes them well, special. yeah. Well, the Road Warrior, yeah. the world actually feels like even beyond mm-hmm. the oil tribe you know and humongous is mm. true it feels like there's more you know what i mean there are other yeah. people out there there's places to go and it's not just the uh, narration of the feral boy who eventually like grows up to be the leader of the northern tribes it's like it just feels like there's more than just max max is the catalyst mm-hmm. of the story not like you know yeah i, I think I, I wouldn't say he's a supporting character so much as he is and i regret to keep bringing him into this but he's the conan of the story. I mean, if Rao is a, a Conan villain, Max is the role that Conan usually plays in the classic Robert E. Howard stories. He's a guy who comes into a situation which has an existing problem, and he's very good at what he does, and he's eventually drawn into the conflict, he helps solve it, and he moves on. Well, but Conan usually, like, actually tries to help. Max just kind of mm-hmm. stumbles True. into helping. Like, it's like, ah, right. oh, shit, I need yeah. this gas. I yeah, guess I'm going to have to be driving the tanker. <laughs> but, you know, Conan yeah. is like a mercenary. He's not someone yeah. who is like, oh, I'm going to do this out of my goodness of my heart. It's like, oh, you're a, a strong warrior, man. Here's some coins to, you know, guard something. So so there's a similar kind of moral ambivalence about the characters. Mm-hmm. Ashley was not aware of that about the Conan character. Yeah, yeah. I thought he yeah, was Yeah, of course, more... to be clear, that that's how he appears in the stories. In the movies, okay, yeah. as was, with I, Mad I, Max. I is like a more revenge story thing. Sorry, in movies, as with Fist of the North Star, yeah. he's more of like a revenge arc. So this is all getting yeah. a bit confusing. Yeah, Mad <laughs> Especially Max... as on top of that, Mad Max had a revenge arc in his first movie, but from Road Warrior on, he has the he's just, Conan yeah, traveling. wandering thing. Yeah. Well, like, yeah. you know, I really enjoy, um, to be perfectly honest, I really like the Mad Max setup of Max being kind of almost silent just like audience in on whatever story is going on you know what i mean because mm-hmm. i just yeah, I lo- that, that's his role as a pov character is fascinating yeah well i mean it's just kind of cool because you know in so many of these stories particularly like things like post-apocalyptic stuff we get the whole like we're trying to rebuild the world and blah 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 and usually the main character is the the one who will solve the issues but this guy he mm. just he wanders around and he finds the ones, you know what I mean? The people who actually are rebuilding society, you know, and kind of helps them out and then moves on. So. And it's also a real economy of names. Like that's one big difference between Fist of the North Star. There are so many named characters and named groupings and so on in that movie that quite obviously people listening notice we may have trouble keeping them straight. But with the Road Warrior, you know, how many people even have given names beyond Max Oh, and Lord oh, Humongous. Oh, I know the answer to this. I know they all have names. They just don't say them in the movies. But all of them have names, and they're great. Mm-hmm. Like George yep. Miller, like has whole notes of all these people, yeah. and like yeah, but, but that that doesn't count. That does, I mean, like I'm sure, like there's it <laughs> look, look, when we were talking about Fist of the North Star, we didn't really, for example, it is so much detail that Rao has his own spinoff series about these events from his point of view. Like that's how much ancillary material Fist of the North Star has. Well, it's like. And a series that ran for, like, over 100 episodes in the 80s. Well, if we want to talk but about that, But I'm just talking like, about it as a movie. Fist of the North no, Star. These characters the have no names. I think yeah. that, okay, I think Fist of the North Star, the movie, we do really need to mention that this movie came out, what, like a year after the show started airing? Yeah. And so it was between, like, it's the first show's, like, arcs. So it was probably more to try to grab people to watch the show. If, you know, like, and to buy the manga. Yeah, and to buy yeah, it's like a that, greatest and to, hits collection. Like, yeah, monopolize on yeah. people who haven't seen it yet, and which totally explains why. I I mean, like after looking it up, it looks like they heavily compressed like the first few arcs mm-hmm. of the show slash manga into this 
movie. Um, and there's an adaptation within that as well, like messing with the chronology of certain things, from my understanding. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And, like, those so, two little kids apparently are incredibly um, important to the plot of the manga. Right. It made me yeah. kind of want to explore the manga, regardless of the many entrails I'm sure to face. <laughs> yeah, well, because the She's there are large sections <laughs> of motivation and uh, exposition in in North Star that are just explained away in one line. You know, at the start of the movie, it's like, Ken used to be your best friend, but now he is your enemy. <laughs> okay, we get it. <laughs> motivation the bad guy <laughs> There's like three different bad guys, and they were all his brother in some way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that's exactly the problem. Uh, and that's what I, I was trying to get to with the road star, with dinner. the road warrior name thing. This is, is that true. it doesn't it's not it doesn't just have a really well built world. It's an extreme economy of world building. Mm-hmm. It gives you just enough information to follow the plot, and it suggests all the time that there's probably more information that it's not telling you. It, it creates an illusion of a world. And then threads a needle to all the little bits you need. Here's one community. Here's another community. Here's a suggestion that the rest of the world beyond them is crap for whatever reason. And that's really all you need to know. You know, the great thing about the Mad Max movies in general, uh, except for maybe the first, is like it really trusts mm-hmm. its audience to fill in the blank, you know, and to know that something else is going on or these other, you know, to just get that mm-hmm. like. Well, geez, even in like uh, Fury Road, just to get that, oh yeah, okay, this this tribe of of warrior slash warrior women on bikes, yeah, that's that makes total sense. At some point, <laughs> you know, they were attacked and people were stolen away. That's how they got Furiosa. Totally makes sense. You know what I mean? Like, well, there's, yeah, there's a lot they... of details that are just thrown in, but aren't important to the plot and aren't explained at all. My yeah. single favorite shot in Fury Road yes. was the stilt men because they drive yes. along. They appear in mm-hmm. medium range. We don't get a single close-up. It's not explained who they are, what they are, why they're using stilts. We never see them again. That's world building. It yes. implies this whole thing that's going on beyond the movie with all its logic, doesn't draw attention to it, and immediately moves on. And when you Honestly, find out if that I was that... going to single out one scene why I love that movie, it would be the stilt men shot because that, that was like, that was just beautiful. And and you find out just tangentially that that place was where the green place used was, to be too. What used to be the green place? Yeah. yeah so so you get yeah. kind of yeah. this like moment. Oh, those stilts were used on purpose, and da 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 da, and like your whole yeah. brain starts to click along with what that implies, you know? Yep. They, but they let they let you put that together. Yeah. Yeah. As, as they don't draw a map for you. Yeah. I had watched Strawberry in a while before I watched it uh, for this, and. You know, it, it just consists of what compresses with little visual character moments, which, mm-hmm. especially right after watching Millstar, which partially it's followed partially just because of the amount of material they're working with. Like, like I said, they really have to they have to state motivations as bluntly as possible because otherwise the movie would make no sense because it is these like it's like plot point, plot point, plot point. But so you know, even in the very first scene in Road Warrior, there's you know this great little bit where. Max is, you know, trying to fend off the the motorcycle guy, the the biker gang guy, and but at the same time he's kind of like scurrying about trying to grab all these pox and helmets and things to grab as little fuel as he can. Like he's sort of pathetic. And like in, in a more standard movie, I think he'd just be, you know, staring off this this villain, this biker guy. But instead, he's scrambling about because fuel is so important in this world that he's trying to get it. And then when the biker guy pulls the bolt out of his arm, you know, he doesn't chuck it aside; he puts it back. Because you gotta, you, this is a, uh, it's the end times. So you need to keep, uh, you need to keep your bolts, even if they've been used, and like just little stuff like that is really what yeah. makes it. I think I, I love the reveal mm-hmm. of the tanker uh, filled with sand because, again, they don't say a goddamn word. The tanker has flipped. It's pouring out sand. Max looks at the gyrocopter guy. They share a moment, and then the gyrocopter guy like flies off into the sunset. It's awesome, you know, yeah. just like. <laughs> It's a much more satisfying than in the, you should have killed him. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I just destroyed my entire empire and beat this guy's pulse. But uh, this little girl whose flower I literally crushed two scenes ago, I'll listen to now, I guess. Uh, well, speaking about the visual quality of North Star, except for a couple of scenes, the animation quality, it felt to me more like a TV show than an actual movie. 
yeah. Uh, I think the TV the team actually made it. That was my understanding. That makes sense because of the 80s yeah. movies we yeah. have seen anime so far, like it really was not as high quality, you know. Although, I'll, although to be fair, you know, some of the stuff we've seen, like I, I think I, I made this point to, last time with Golgo. Yeah. You know, Golgo might be too. trashy, but it's it's made by Uzamu Jazaki, who's one of the you know most respected directors of his era. Fair enough. This is true. So this is you, true. you can see that he's he's yeah. he has a level of competence in style and finesse. This is basically, um, I know, even saying this, if any of the fans hear me say this, they're gonna like hunt me down. But this is like the '80s equivalent of a Naruto movie. You know, it's a movie <laughs> based on a big hit shonen series to appeal to fans in the theaters. Yeah. It's not being made uh, to compete with Miyazaki. It's not like a big art movie. Or anything other than like one of the Naruto movies. Because yeah, a lot of the animations and even the fight scenes, like a lot of time, it's just Ken doing his best Bruce Lee impression. Uh, oh man, and, that's right. He, <laughs> all these yeah. punches, but like they must have spent all their. I mean, all those exploding heads, man, must have taken a lot of time. Like that's <laughs> all the exploding heads are, are when all the like movement and form very, comes into the very animation. Well and, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Honestly, the, the times when he was punching people, I realized, oh my god, I've seen that parody so many times. <laughs> so I could never take it seriously because like, that was like a visual shorthand for me, like ridiculous over the top move that they do in comedy and they never do seriously. <laughs> yeah, like, oh my like god. That, uh, it's like a that, that, that thing, like I was, I was rolling like pretty much every time. <laughs> Oh, yeah. They're all supposed to be martial artists, but you don't actually see them doing martial arts. They're That's just true. like they're just flailing around and then poking each other. They're not, <laughs> or like, like like burying a hand in a chest. <laughs> exactly. Just you don't see them like uh, blocking and then dodging or whatever. No. Oh God, the worst yeah. dodge actually in that movie. They did have a dodge where Ken at one point dodges. Um, oh God, his blonde haired used to be bro. Um, and Wait, I got this J- Jingen or Jengi or Jaji. No, 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 no. This is like his bro from another mother kind of bro. Uh, not, the, not bro. Oh, this is the, uh, the one who, the that one who bro. stole his girl. Um, like, and when he dodged, like literally I could see that they had just moved the cell over, you know, they just went Soop, and then put the hand. <laughs> I was like, no, no, that is. That is not as good as I thought it would be animation wise. It also it gives me a new appreciation really for Kawajiri. You know, the guy who made Ninja Scroll and other things like that. Ninja because Scroll. I think I want to point out here when I mentioned him, OVAs. Those were those were home video productions. Those weren't like feature films. He he never made a proper feature film. He made stuff for home video. But it looked really good. It certainly yeah. looked better than that. Yeah. For as much as I am not a fan of Ninja Scroll, it at least is animated pretty well, so... Yeah, yeah there's not a lot of movement mm-hmm. in the star. I think it's very static. Kawajiri yeah. was one of the best of the Schlockmeisters, yeah. but he was a Schlockmeister in my opinion. Actually, he did do a movie. It was called Lensman, but it's not very good, so let's not talk about it. Oh, the Lensman <laughs> from, the, uh, from the novels? That yeah, from, yeah, from the novels. He did an anime Lensman. That might be worth talking at some point, actually, but it's not good. I wrote a review of it once. Sorry. <laughs> the Ooh, I did want to also no, talk okay. about <laughs> quickly, quickly, I wanted to talk about ladies, because we already talked about ladies in North Star. Ladies in yes. Road Warrior, like... Zan. Big prop to the ladies and how they use them. Although, so, again, one gets raped and killed horror, horribly. Virginia but... Hay. <laughs> yeah, but one, of them, one of them was Virginia Hay, yeah. who was yeah. Zan on, on Farscape. Yes, yes. but... Virginia Hay was your, so good. You got, your, you got your warrior lady who mm-hmm. uh, sacrificed... Great, her. great ace hair. Oh my God! Such good hair, and yes. then you've got your your lady who inexplicably falls for the gyro guy, which <laughs> to me speaks of how rare dudes are in this area. Hey man, I mean he knows how to fly a helicopter. It is know? true, and his teeth are mostly <laughs> all there. So. Yeah, I'm, I just think it's an Australian thing. <laughs> it might be. <laughs> we should ask Ope if Australian dudes are just particularly. Gangly. No, but, but just just think about it. All those like neighbors, stars everywhere. Someone like him must be very unusual. <laughs> okay, that neighbors joke is probably going to go over some people's heads. I think, isn't it? <laughs> probably. But, look, think of any hot Australian actor anyone ever knows, probably. ever like Chris Hemsworth or his brother. They were probably on an Australian soap called Neighbors at some point. Trust me on that. 
It's a statistical fact. Well, it's a smaller country, so... Oh, yeah, yeah. I've, yeah. I've heard a lot about Neighbors from a, another internet friend. I've, I've watched a bit of Neighbors because I am someone who would watch something like Neighbors. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. You know, a lot of people have watched it. You, you yeah. know who watches a lot of Australian soaps? Who's that? Martin McDonough. He used to cite them as a major influence in his plays, and I think to a lesser extent in his films. You know, the In Bruges guy, Seven Psychopaths. Oh, a huge fan of Australian soap. Talked about them when he went to Australia. I'm dead serious. Look you it know, up. I, I, th- that makes me more interested in checking out Neighbors. <laughs> it's it's not. I didn't say he was a fan of Neighbors. I said he was a fan of Australian soaps. I don't know Dude, how he feels I'm about Neighbors. I'm not saying that, okay. It could be all home and away for him. Fair enough. It's There's just more like than any one. other soap in which, like, you know, drama happens over an incredibly, like, long period of time. You get people having conversations about the person, you know. <laughs> like, and they have to explain, like, three times in a row. Ah, let's get off of soaps, because I could go on about the weird structure yeah. of soaps. Perfect. Actually, you know what? <laughs> Mel Gibson, his first role, wasn't it? He oh, didn't go- come up through TV shows or anything? Yeah, yeah. Although the first yeah. Mad Max was his first role. So this was, like, his second. Oh, yeah, yeah, he yeah. Was, oh I didn't know that, that it was... Very first was, role. I, there's a story this, about this. George Miller picked out um picked out Mel Gibson because he saw him get in a bar fight in Australia. That was how he cast him as Max. <laughs> as he, you know, he, he just walked up and asked him if he wanted to be in a movie. Hey, son, it's like it's, like the, it's the more Texas? violent Australian version of Linklater and Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> yeah, well, if if you look at the original <laughs> Mad Max film, I mean, there's I, very I, little dialogue, there's very little character work. It's a very tight-budgeted mm-hmm. indie film where most people speak in an almost incomprehensible Australian argo. Although I suppose it makes sense to Australians. So it's not like it's something that he had to be very physically taxing in terms of acting, but he did have to be able to be thrown around a bit. So that's probably a good casting decision. Yeah, physicality. Uh, I've defended Mel Gibson on this well. podcast. Mm-hmm. Yes, you have. There, there are some people who praise his performances in the Max films, and I wouldn't quite go that far, but I think he sells the physicality very well. Probably just him as a human yeah. being. Yeah, being exactly. all gypsy. Yeah. I wonder how Hardy got it. Like, did he go like, you well, know, well, like... Tom Hardy's just a really good actor. <laughs> <laughs> That's a point. I, mean, I guess, I I guess the Miller now has... Well, I, um, you know, it, it was definitely a case okay. of, you know, he had a big budget. I mean, he got Hardy, he got Theron. What kind of big names... That is true. But then, uh, of course, for the main villain, he got, you know, the guy who played the villain in the original film, who's otherwise unknown. Right. Right. But um, I kind of love that about him, where he's like, you know, hey, you want to be another villain? Do I? You know? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, he, I mean, he tried to keep, he tried to keep as much of the cast as Australian as possible, which, which is for the best, probably, to keep true to the spirit of the franchise. Well, and, also, and I mean, like the man that is an accent, and and they're on oh, like yeah. really, really stands out next to like say the brides, you know, with her accent. I wonder, I wonder if they made that decision because yeah. she's what South African. She's right? from a different. Yeah, she's yeah. South. She's South African. Yeah. I'm, I'm surprised. Yeah, like, they, like say to just go ahead and use her rather than an American accent. I made that an interesting choice. Well, I mean, the, there's um, a tendency to uh, kind of impose American accents regardless. Yeah of whether or not it would make sense, just out of the assumption it sells better. Well, yeah. Uh, the original yeah. Mad Max actually was redubbed with American voices. What? <laughs> yeah, seriously. Because, you know, Australian is, is just too hard to handle. You know, there's also stuff like, say, Xena. We have a New Zealand actress, and she's playing, like, an ancient warrior woman from a pseudo-mythological Greek mm-hmm. setting. But it's very important that she sounds like an American, for some reason. <laughs> I'm really into the American tendency to, if it's set in another country, then it is in a British accent. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I think that comes case... down to having a lot of British character actors being yeah. ported in all the time. That could be it too. Yeah. <laughs> That's our shorthand of yeah. If, if we're gonna have the characters speak in English when they shouldn't be, but we'll make them sound not American. Although anyway, I guess yeah. it's better than. Back to the movies. Oh yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, yeah, you know, oh, I'm sorry, but but, but I, I just want to say, like, my favorite example is Alexander the Great, you know, to suggest oh, how the cultural difference between the Macedonians, who were considered half barbarian by the rest of the Greeks, all the Greeks sound British and the Macedonians sound Irish. Okay, well, moving on. Moving on. Uh, anyway. Well, bringing it back yeah. to the movies, I actually yes. kind of wondered at times whether they were both taking place in the same world, like... There's these people wandering Asia, exploding each other, and then <laughs> just like a few thousand miles away in Australia, there's these guys 
They're like dune buggies killing each other. Okay, canon accepted. <laughs> I'm like, down with that. <laughs> you want Fist of the North Star to take place in the same universe? Absolutely. Are you kidding? Uh, what? What? Okay, what? Then. What would happen if a Kenshiro came, like, to Australia in this the universe? Mo- well, the movie would be really uh, short. I don't want to so roll up and Ken would just be like, oh, and stop, and then, stop yeah. oppressing these people, and then he would all make them explode. Like, oh, Although, Lord Humongous is much more articulate than any of Ken's foes. Actually, this so. is true. He actually has a pretty decent oh, speech about, like, you know... Come on, you, we'll we'll let you go. Man. Lord Humongous is like a very reasonable middle manager murders people. That's like... <laughs> although he, uh, I still don't understand why he played chicken with the the tanker. Was he just not paying attention? I didn't like that part of the movie has always, even when I was a kid, like w- what was going on that made Humongous crash into the tanker. He's probably just pissed because his plans had all gone awry. Oh, so this is yeah, just... he, he didn't seem like a very logical person. You know, he's a guy calling himself the Ayatollah of Rock and Rolla. <laughs> you know, he, he's there, there's there, there's this kind of pervasive nuttiness in the Mad Max society. Like when the apocalypse happened, it's not like other apocalypses where people you know get kind of depressed and angry and they turn bad. It's more like the apocalypse has happened. This is awesome. We're going to go nuts and we're just going to put on all these clothes and we're going to have these hockey masks and we're going to give ourselves lots of weird names and we're going to go out there and we're going to kill people and we're going to have a great time doing that. You know, actually, I'm thinking that, like, in reality, it would be more that way just based on how, say, when societies in the past have, you know. I think that's how it's going to be in Australia. (laughs) <laughs> like in America, it might be The Walking Dead, but in Australia, God, yeah, I, hope not. I mean, that's people so are gonna feel obligated to be yeah. like, oh, well. I mean, and... That's it, my American compatriots. We are going to create a war band, right? Okay, like this right. is what's going down <laughs> uh, upon apocalypse. Yeah. I mean, so right that... after I finish just shooting myself in dysentery and then die after that. Uh, excuse me, that's the okay. depressing oh. way to do an apocalypse. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You are not dying yep. of dysentery. You sorry, are in yep. a mohawk, and you are riding with my team. You will die historic on the Fury Road. Absolutely. I Valhalla, have... man. Got to get there. Shiny and chrome. Right. Well, I do have to point out, you can't find hockey masks like Lord Humongous anymore. <gasps> no! Amber, I just don't have the physicality to survive. <laughs> Anyway, don't worry, we'll make this happen. Well, I'll, I'll get you some bondage gear. You'll get a nice chain around your neck. You'll ride with some guy. Fine. <laughs> yeah, the poor, the poor twink guy. I, guess. I, don't, I, don't, I feel like the twink guy. Like he seemed, he seemed pretty Just, all right. You no, know, I'd, I'd be pretty angry if he got. Well, he probably was pretty all right. You know. I think he was pretty all right with the situation. I mean, like, yeah, and oh what's God, his face a, was awfully in the head. put out. <laughs> I'd be angry. And it's also, you know, interestingly, like, they, they never come out to say it, but they kind of skirt around it. I mean, Humongous explicitly refers to one of his groups as gay boy berserkers. Well, you know, he, how, he how much more homo, explicitly homoerotic films you, get? When you know? he's trying to keep Mr. Mohawk from going on a rampage, he straight up says, we might still fight, but right now we have to be calm. We've all lost somebody we love, you know? So clearly this was a love relationship between... Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, and apparently, I read up on that because I was intrigued by this in 1981, you know? And apparently Miller had specifically done that because originally he was a woman and the warrior woman was a dude. And then he was like, no, this is like a post-apocalyptic society. Like, a lot of the societal boundaries have broken down. And he flipped them purposely to kind of point that out. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. All right. Um, so let's yeah, go I'm go in the old end circle here. Would you recommend these two pictures, William? I feel like if there's an appeal to the Fist of the North Star movie, it's to people who are already fans of the Fist of the North Star franchise. So I guess if you're familiar with the manga or the anime, you might get something out of this. But if it's your first exposure to the franchise, which it was for me, it's bewildering, alienating, has some entertaining elements, but mostly feels too long and too over-involved. I would not recommend it under those circumstances. On the other hand, while Mad Max 2, The Road Warrior, is a sequel, it can be watched completely independently of any Mad Max films and enjoyed entirely on its own merits. And on top of that, is one of the best action films of the 1980s, in my opinion. So it comes with a very high recommendation. Amber? 
I would definitely not recommend Fist of the North Star, the movie, even for somebody who is familiar with the franchise, because the plot is absolutely confounding, and the animation, except the explosions, is really not great. Like, I assume that if you're going to go into that franchise, go with the manga or the show, which I haven't experienced, but I have heard good things about it from people who enjoy 80s, like, nostalgia kind of stuff. It's fairly influential. Road Warrior, I don't know if you have noticed, but I'm a bit of a groupy <laughs> person. Oh, we've so... noticed. <laughs> <laughs> what with my knowledge of the names of the characters and so on. Mm-hmm. So I would heavily recommend watching Road Warrior if you've never watched it before. And in fact, you haven't watched it before. That's a travesty. And you should immediately watch it, like, now. So Yeah, I, I might like Road Warrior more the next time I watch it. But as it is, I would still, I would recommend it definitely over Fist of the North Star. I would say it's basically prototypical Fury Road, so just do that. those two as a double feature, and you'll have a damn good time. And Jesse? Well, you know what? Road Warrior, William called it an action movie, and I do appreciate how it tells the story through action instead of through dialogue. It's mostly wordless, and I do like its visual style, so I do recommend it. And Fist of the North Star, I would say, it's, well, I found it entertaining, but only as a, as a comedy, not not as a drama. If you're watching it as like part of a drinking game, or if you, if, if you're high or something, and you're watching it like late at night, it, it's actually pretty hilarious. But if you're watching it wanting something serious, yeah, move on to something else because this is not it. Don't drink every time someone explodes because you'll die of alcohol poisoning. Yeah, you'd be real trash. Absolutely uh, bad. Yeah. Pretty much similar to everyone else. Road Warrior is one of the greats. Pretty much should be absolutely watched. Tight storytelling, great visuals, good action all around. Fist of the North Star has some value as just a schlock festival, which personally I could find some entertainment in. There are fun parts to it, but because just all these manga plot lines smashed into a truncated space, it does feel a little disconnected and a, a little tedious at points in between. In between, there are great moments, but they, they're... Not quite frequent enough, so I would give it a measured recommendation if you think already that you might enjoy something like that. But otherwise, probably steer clear or go to one of the other outlets for that franchise. Mm-hmm. As for next episode, William. I actually have a, I'm going to say one final point. We mentioned briefly earlier that Hollywood usually uses British actors and British accents to indicate foreign people. Basically, Hitchcock <laughs> is a director. <laughs> Right. Yes. When he depicted foreign non-British people in his American films, in for example, Topaz has a lot to do with Cubans. He did not have them use British accents. Thank you. I feel obliged to say that. Uh, actually, you know what? I forgot to mention something. We mentioned Conan a couple of times. Uh, Rao, the bad guy, was actually, it was clearly based on um, Frank Rosetta's Death Dealer, which... Huh. He was he was also an illustrator of Conan, so and I can see why the uh, the manga guy would be a fan of him because he also does manly men doing manly things to each other. <laughs> yeah, Frazetta is actually the reason we usually picture Conan as a big shirtless guy with rippling muscles. Howard usually describes him as wearing whatever armor is appropriate to where he's currently working, which makes sense I yeah. mean, given the mercenary nature of his work. Exactly. So, moving on to what we'll be discussing next time. Next time, we will be looking at horror. Specifically, anthology horror. And specifically, anthology period horror. That's a nice little niche there. So, firstly, in anime, we'll be looking at Ayakashi Samurai Horror Tales, which is an anime series which produced three different little horror stories set in Japan's past. And then we'll also be looking at Phantasmagoria, or, sorry, uh, Phantasmagory, Phantasmagory, Tales of the Dead. (laughs) Looking at Tales of the Dead, (laughs) Tales of the Dead, a French work which um, inspired much of the earliest Gothic fiction, English language, and details a number of traditionally German horror stories for a French audience. We will be reading this, however, in English translation. So it'll be the first time since our very first podcast that we'll be looking at a text and comparing it to an anime. Oh, and speaking of our first podcast, this is our one-year anniversary. 
So, yeehaw. Yay! Huzzah! <laughs> That's and definitely why we're doing this. <laughs> I chose a text for that I'm reason. very proud of us. We've had a good <laughs> job to you. Oh, totally. We've had a solid year. <laughs> we produced okay. almost a whole bunch of them, right? Like, we've, we've done pretty good. Uh, I think this is our sixth episode. Six episodes, guys! High five, someone. Yeah, if, if this was a, a Kawajiri OVA, we'd uh, we'd be done. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're we we produce on a, a long term schedule because of the quality, of course. We're like Absolutely. a British TV show. A British TV, yes, exactly. Yeah. Or the Venture Brothers. <laughs>